Welcome to Innovation Center's three-part video series on value-based healthcare, what every clinician should know. Payment impacts the kind of care clinicians provide. These videos will take the viewer from the current state of fee-for-service to assuming both up and downside of risk in value-based care and will tell you what you need to know to be successful. This shift from fee-for-service to value-based care means that you can take care of patients the way you were trained to do. For more on how to obtain CME or CEU credit and for important supplementary materials, please see the video description included with this video. What you are watching is going to change your mind about financial incentives that align with patient care. Hello. I'm Dr. Sanjay Dadamani, a practicing cardiologist and senior physician advisor at CMMI, the innovation arm of CMS. This video on aligning financial incentives for better care will tell you what you need to know about alternative payment models or APMs. By the end of this CME activity, you should be able to define an episode of care and the principles of risk-based contracting, identify what payment models are available to clinicians transitioning away from fee-for-service, and learn what patients need to know about being cared for in a risk-based model of care. We'll also have you identify how data through analytics and business intel can help you successfully manage financial risk and more importantly, deliver better care, more timely care. Let's begin by hearing from a physician and patient who are linked in a risk-based model. Together, they will share their experiences with you to help you understand what goes into the secret sauce. My name is Dr. Brashanti Ganesa. I'm a medical oncologist here at the Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders. I've been in practice for about 10 years. Uh, I, I serve on uh, various committees here. I'm part of the executive board. Uh, currently, I'm the oncology medical director for one of our large local hospitals, and I serve on their ACO's board of trustees. We wanted to be part of the oncology care model um, simply because we want to be on the forefront of how oncology care is delivered in the future. Uh, we've always focused on quality in this practice, so we wanted to keep that momentum going and to improve patient care, and OCM has given us the resources to do that. OCM focuses on a team approach to care. Uh, it's not just about the patient's cancer, it's about the patient. And OCM has allowed us to put this philosophy into, into daily practice. Uh, it makes us more accountable, and all of our team members have to come together to be successful in this program. I've worked with many patients over the years through the OCM program. Um, one that comes to mind is Nancy, and she has been my patient since June of 2015. My name's Nancy Lee. I'm 67 years old. I am a widow. Um, I was diagnosed with ovarian and stomach cancer in uh, May of 2015. I like going here because it's like a one-stop shop. I get my x-rays here, all my blood work done. Um, my treatment is done here and the girls upstairs are wonderful. Um, the nurses are great. All the, the technicians are awesome. I'm never scared. I, they always tell me what's going to happen before any of my treatment's done. And um, I just love coming here. I really love uh, the case manager. Um, I can call her and talk to her anytime I have any problems. One of the most special parts of being the patient's nurse case manager is that I'm their person. They know that I'm on their team. I'm part of their team. I, they know they can call me. And part of being a nurse case manager is a huge part of that is being their advocate. At the start of the model, it was about putting processes and procedures in place to meet the requirements of OCM. Um, we looked at care plan visits and survivorship visits, and you know, we did depression screenings, ultimately risk stratification. 
which patients would benefit most from intervention. And we went from looking at data to looking at overall care and how we can improve it. They usually tell you, for my type of cancer, this is the treatment that they're gonna offer to me. And um, they give me a book and it tells me all the side effects that's gonna happen to it. It tells me if I'm gonna lose my hair, what medicines I need to take for precautions, what foods to eat. They send me to a nutritionist that's work, that works here at the center. I have decided January of 2018 to stop my treatment because of these severe sickness and side effects and to live a happy life. Everybody came together and listened to the patient about her goals of care and that she wanted quality of life. And so the excitement there is that you're giving patients back some control. OCM is a different care model. Uh, what's exciting is that it completely changes the way we think of patients. It's a medical home model, and a medical home model really changes our sense of what all we are responsible for in that patient. Uh, so it goes back to not just treating the patient's cancer, but treating the entire patient. If we can increase quality of care, limit, decrease, or even eliminate ER visits, hospitalizations, and ensure that Medicare is there for future generations, that's a win-win for everybody. What a great story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It really exposes us to how policy and payment can change the way care is delivered. Value-based care is a transition that can show some really positive results. For a different perspective, let's hear from Dr. Bob Kocher, a physician who was one of the early investors in health IT and a partner in the venture capital firm Venrock. So I'm Bob Kocher, I'm an internal medicine doctor. I did my training at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. One of the most joyful part of my experience was we were asked to go visit patients in their homes after hospitalizations to see what it's like to be a patient after we take care of them. I'll never forget seeing the calendar of one of my patients where she had, in a month, 13 different days in which she had to come encounter our healthcare system, either for a lab test or for a specialty visit or to see me. And I asked myself, well, how, how can she do that? How can she have a job and be a mom and, and do all these things? And then I remember looking at the table of a patient and seeing 14 medications and the instructions for how to take them and which ones you take with food, which without food, and thought to myself, my goodness, like this is impossible to actually do what we said. And so that's led me to have a life of trying to simplify healthcare and make it more comprehensible, more understandable, simpler for a patient. And not a system that actually is mainly organized around the convenience of the doctor, but actually around the ability for a patient to achieve the goals we want. And so as I've gotten more experience, I've realized that a lot of these care models, one of their virtues is that they really pay us to do that, uh, to take the time to get to know our patients and help them define the goals together. And when, we, when we're doing the things that the patient most desires, the patients do it. They, they are adherent with the medications, they follow the plans, they call you when they're not feeling well, and, and you can be a great help to them. And the amount of joy that I get back from patients when we do that, you know, is, is impossible to define, but makes me happy every day. And makes me know that I'm doing something that matters and something that's helpful and something that, you know, is bigger and more important than sort of me. You know, physicians just shy away from talk about financial incentives and, and the whole financial piece of healthcare. How do we, you know, make it much simpler for them to understand? We all go to medical school to learn how to take great care of patients and treat every member, or every patient as if they're your mom or your dad. And then you start working. And the economic incentives as we discover them, like often work against it and make it hard to make that house call or make that extra phone call or take the extra time. So I think the most important thing is to figure out how to make the payment system actually align with the care that we want to deliver to our patients. And if that works, doctors will figure it out because we all know what you can do to take a better, you know, to, to have better outcomes occur. It's the extra attention to detail that today is hard to do in the current payment model. So how does a physician sort of start off on sort of getting away from fee-for-service well, in fee-for-service, we spend so much time thinking about how to make more RVUs. And in the new payment models, you spend all your time thinking about how to have fewer RVUs. 
if you step back, I think we all intuitively know what you can do differently to help a patient actually not need the ER, not need the hospital, not need that extra specialty visit. And that's by spending more time with that subset of patients who are sick that you can help. And having them have more information about what to watch for in their conditions and, and what are the early signs of a complication. Uh, and then to call you. And when they call you, it's pretty easy. When you're at risk, if they call you and you say go to the ER, you're giving them a thousand dollar doctor visit. If you instead say come and see me or go see them at their house, you're avoiding a thousand dollar doctor visit and it's easy to imagine how you could do that for a thousand dollars. And so I think these new models, you know, allow the doctor to use imagination to figure out like what are all the things I can do to help a patient have the best outcome they can achieve and do it most cost effectively. And usually that's more primary care, it's more behavioral health care, and it's more time spent with the patient and their family talking about what to watch for and what matters and when to call me. Clearly, we're not trying to eliminate ED visits or hospitalizations. What are we trying to do? I think we're trying to be more in the loop on what's happening with the patient. Patients have a lot of different things that can be happening at any, any one time. And the current healthcare system doesn't do a great job always at coordinating that care and having one doctor be able to help organize it to make sure the right things happen at the right time and that things aren't dropped uh, kind of in the handoffs. And so for sure, when a patient goes to an ER in these new payment models, it makes sense for the primary care doctor and their staff to be talking to the ER physician about what happened and what to do and how to follow up and how to make sure that the recovery is as smooth as it can be. It also makes sense with specialist doctors to have more communication about what's the plan of care, what are the priorities, what is the patient's preferences, and how do we make sure that we deliver those? And not let it happen sort of all as one-off individual events that maybe in Epic you'll somehow discover uh, in the myriad of notes that you'll find in your patients. It's, it's much more about talking about a patient with the, with, with the whole set of providers to make sure that we're delivering the care that actually is best for the patient. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about alternative payment models. Uh, we know that many physicians are coming together and being linked into an accountable care organization or ACO. And what does that landscape of ACOs look like to you? And, and tell us a little bit more about a physician who's joining a practice that happens to be part of an ACO. Yeah, I think ACOs are really neat. I think they're one of the most successful ways doctors can make the transition from traditional fee-for-service to risk-based payment models. The data has been really exciting to see. Now that we have several years of ACO data, what we're seeing is that doctors and in independent practices, what, what CMS calls the low revenue ACOs, which are basically the ones that are not owned by hospitals, have on average performed really well. They've saved a bunch of money for Medicare, and they've done that by avoiding a bunch of complications for patients. I think it's super cool to see independent doctors actually learning how to do a model of care better than the large players in healthcare and faster. And we're seeing doctors who entered these be more satisfied in their professional career, stay in these models of care, and make more money. The ACA landscape gives doctors a full range of options, ranging from upside-only risk to full risk, that you can assume as you gain more experience taking care of populations of patients cost-effectively. What's great about the models is that as you get more confident in your ability to deliver higher quality care at lower cost, you can make more money by virtue of capturing more of the savings in the models that have upside and downside risk. You know, in terms of, you talked about segments of populations and you talked about, you know, health IT. Can you help tie that together in terms of sort of risk segmenting and trying to go after the right patients that really need these more sort of uh, resource heavy uh, models of care and those patients who are the walking well and how they can be cared for at the same time. In terms of data and information, when you're in these payment models, these non fee for service payment models, you benefit from having more information. The trick is having the information be useful. And so there's a lot of tools doctors can buy. In my experience, the ones that are most useful are the ones that help you have more information about your sickest patients. So it's things related to the hospital and whether they're admitted or discharged. It was specialty visits and whether or not they had one or not. It's did they pick up the medication and which medication did they pick up? Are they starting a new medication that you'd want to talk to them about? That information I find really changes the way in which you care for a patient and what you want to deliver to that patient and what you want to talk about with that patient. There's also a bunch of tools that help you understand the cost of what happened after you saw that patient and what, do, what were the procedures and tests done by that next doctor that saw them that you can talk to the doctor about to better 
manage total cost of care. There's also tools that can help you stratify your population to figure out which are the patients that are likely to get sick next so you can see them more often and hopefully intervene early when you can make a difference. Uh, but I'd also say, before you invest in a lot of technology, I would tell doctors that your intuition's also right. When I've talked to doctors and said, well, what are the patients that you're worried about? They consistently can write out the 20 or 30 patients that are top of mind. And almost always those patients match nearly perfectly with the, with, the, with the patients that software or predict that are gonna be the ones you should worry about. So I would say doctor intuition remains one of the best tools we have, but certainly information about what's happening after they see you is invaluable. One of the most exciting things about these new payment models is that as soon as you enter them, you begin getting data from CMS that you didn't know they had that you've never seen before about what happened after that patient saw you. And it is astonishing to see the cost of different things that occur, whether it's specialty testing or hospital services or post-hospital rehabilitatory, rehabilitatory care or Part B drug, uh, drug prices. Uh, and when you see it, you step back and say, well, wait a minute, like, well, am I, is it working? Is, am I getting my, is, are we getting our money's worth for that? It, are we using it thoughtfully, all these different resources? Uh, and it's totally fascinating uh, because there's a whole bunch of care that patients get that you don't know about until you see the data and you see that they're getting a bunch of care. Um, and it gives you a chance to better coordinate by having that information because you know all the different pieces you have to pull together to actually have a plan of care that makes the best sense for a patient. Although we're not you know, talking about a full capitation model here, um, we are talking about how primary care physicians can sort of get into uh, the saddle of, mm -hmm. of taking better care of patients through uh, primary care first or PCF. Yeah. So these new payment models offer like the, the full escalator of risk possibilities. So you can get on at the start and do upside only and learn how to do it and generate savings and see that you can actually make lots of tweaks to your practice to actually be confident that you can consistently deliver higher quality, lower cost care. What's great about these payment models is that as you gain more confidence in your ability, you can gain more reward for that higher quality, lower cost care model that you built. And as you assume more risk, many practices actually generate a lot more revenue and a lot more income. And that allows them to do a couple things. A, grow their practices and invest more in the team that you may want to employ to help support a larger population of patients, help build out things that you can't get in your community, whether that might be mental health care or pain management or diagnostics that, you know, that, that meet your needs. Um, and certainly, um, you can make more money, which rewards the risk that you take and all the work that you put into all of these models of care that save both Medicare and your patients and you money. Bob, with these videos, uh, physicians might be led to thinking that they're very focused on primary care. And while that's incredibly important as sort of the first portal of entry for patients, I almost want to, to speak uh, to specialists. As you know, I'm a cardiologist. Yeah and still practicing, and what does it mean like to be a specialist uh, in an alternative payment model? A specialist in these models of care can redefine the way in which they engage with their patients and with their referrers. I think a specialist is actually becoming the professors, the teachers, and helping to educate the primary care doctors who prefer patients, what's a, what are the things that the PCP can do in their office to better care for and actually reduce the number of referrals? Conversely, when a patient comes to the specialist, instead of saying, what is the entire workup I can do today, you become much more parsimonious about what are the steps I need to, what are the discoveries I need to make along the way to determine the best course of care for a patient, and they'd be much more interested in engaging the patient in their care to know that if you recommend a plan of action, that the patient's highly likely to be adherent with that plan of action and successful. The great specialists that you refer to in these models also go the extra mile and help monitor the patient to make sure that they're achieving the clinical outcomes and the quality measure goals that we have for different diseases. That's a great example, Bob. From a surgical lens, think of an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon and what it means for them to be in a bundled payment and what, what that really means. Yeah, so bundled payments are, I believe, a very smart way to pay for a temporal set of care for people. Whether that's a surger, surgical procedure and it's recovery or a, a year of chronic disease care, it's a way to create incentive for the entire team of people to be on the same page. It also helps figure out what are, the, what are the steps in the process that today are inefficient or unreliable and want to work on those 
to improve them such that they don't fail as often and that patients do better. One of the other features of episode-based payments is that it creates a lot of incentive to engage the patient in knowing exactly what to expect, how to know if they're on track, and then what to do if they're not so that they come back for medical care long before they have complications. In most cases, there's opportunities to make the pre-procedure care more efficient and cost-effective and the post-procedure recovery um, better managed and more coordinated and also more cost-effective. Uh, and what's terrific is that these payment models pay everybody more when the outcomes are better. CMS's Design Bundle Payment Models, or BPCI, so physicians can manage an episode of care. What do we need to know about bundles and episodes? Bundles and episodes work because it rewards everybody involved in the patient's care and recovery to be on the same page to make sure the patient gets the best outcome most efficiently. And when that happens, people in the bundles make more money. Not surprisingly, if you're trying to manage risk, you'll invest in things like more access in your office, people to do more outreach to patients, maybe house calls. And these payment models give you the revenue you need to invest in those types of capabilities, which are good for your patients and good for the practice. One of the coolest things um, I've done several times actually is, is go visit patients in their homes. And it's extraordinary what you discover. I mean, you discover A, like they ran the Boston Marathon and, and B, they have, a lot more steps than you would have thought, so they're getting a stress test every day, and, and C, they have more children than you knew about, and, and D, um, wow, their medications are like many more bottles than I knew about, and I wish I knew I would have talked to them about those things. And so I feel like I always discover things when I go visit the patients, and I always feel like after I've done that, when I'm seeing them in my office, I'm, I'm better, and they trust me more, and they're more likely to actually um, have that conversation with me about what they want to have happen. And that makes me a better doctor and it makes me have a lot more fun. We started this video with a physician describing what it was like to embark into a world of value-based care and what it meant for the patient as well. What advice would you give to clinicians thinking about assuming risk? If you want to get started, there are great ACOs in almost every city in the country. I'd encourage you to talk to doctors in this and ask them, how do they like it? How do they get started? Can you join? If there's not one, I'd say, start one, join one. It's been wonderful to see how quickly doctors have learned these new models, succeeded in these models, and how much better care has gotten in the places that have ado adopted these models. So I hope that you start today. In the final part of these three videos, assuming full risk in healthcare, we will feature Dr. Chris Chen, CEO of ChenMed.